Speaker's business, just to say that uh, members are required by Standing Order 79, brackets 4, and I wish to inform the Assembly that in accordance with Standing Order 79, bracket 5, two vacancies exist in the Assembly Commission, which must be filled within 28 days. The next item is uh, the first item of business is a motion to suspend Standing Order 20, bracket 1. Clerk, please read the motion. <coughs> That Standing Order 21 be suspended for the 20th of January 2020. Colin McGrath to move the motion. Thank you. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. As there are eyes from all sides of the chamber and there are no dissenting voices, I am satisfied the cross-community support has been demonstrated. Next item on the order paper is a motion regarding committee membership. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Mr Keith Buchanan replace Mr Gordon Lyons as a member of the business committee. I call Gordon Lyons to move the motion. The question is that the motion standing on the order of paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have that. The next item on the order of paper is a motion regarding committee membership. As with other similar motions, it will be treated as a business motion and there will be no debate. Clerk, please read the motion. That Mr John O'Dowd and Ms Sinead Ennis replace Ms Carl De Cullen and Mr Declan McAleer as members of the business committee. So I, I call Carol Neekillen to move the motion. Moved. The question is that the motion standing on the order of paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have that. Thank you. The next item of business is a motion to suspend standing order 49-2A and 52-2A. Clerk, please read the motion. That standing order 49-2A and standing order 52-2A <coughs> be suspended. I call on Colin McGrath to move the motion. Moved. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. As there are eyes from all sides of the chamber and no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that cross-community support has been demonstrated. The next item of business is the motion on the membership of statutory committees. Clerk, please read the motion. That in accordance with Standing Order 49.3, the membership of statutory committees as detailed in NIA 5, 17 to 22 be approved. I call on Colin McGrath to move the motion. Moved. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper in the names of members of the business committee be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have that. The ayes have it. The next item of business is the motion on the membership of standing committees. Clerk, please. That in accordance with Standing Order 52.3, the membership of standing committees as detailed in NIA 6, 17 to 22 be approved. I call on Colin McGrath to move the motion. Moved. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper in the names of members of the business committee be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have that. Thank you, members. Next item on the agenda, the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-20. Mr. Allister, point of order. Mr. Speaker, can you confirm that this debate <coughs> that we're about to embark upon is a debate on a motion which cannot be amended in consequence of the Executive Office choosing to lay this motion late on Friday? If members were like me, they got notice at 1546 hours. And of course, our standing orders require amendments to be tabled two full days before debate. In consequence, we have reached the farcical situation where we are going to debate a motion that no member of this House can amend. Is that correct? Well, the fact of the matter, Mr. is that the, uh, the Executive Office did table the motion late on Friday. And uh, we issued that out to the business committee. The business committee approved and reaffirmed that this morning at a meeting we had at 
Um, I accept entirely, Mr. Allister, that, and I say this to the House, that uh, it's, it is regrettable that we have the motion coming as late as it did, but I expect that the First and Deputy First Ministers who will address this matter will, will elaborate and deal with that matter to the satisfaction of the House. Um, obviously, I want to make sure that at all times executive business is conducted in a way to this Assembly that allows the Assembly to conduct its duties with uh, the rigorous integrity that it's duty bound to do, and the member will obviously be very much a key person in that regard. So, as I say, the, uh, the standing orders did not provide for the ability to take amendments, and therefore we are in the position we are in. But as I say, even looking at the amendment that had been tabled by Friday, uh, the advice to myself would have been that uh, the motion uh, contained on the order paper today is of a quite specific narrow scope, and therefore amendments which would have been tabled may well have not been ruled uh, as normally uh, acceptable. So that's, that's where we are to, at, at the moment. I have actually written this morning to the First and Deputy First Minister setting out my concerns in relation to that and with the expectation that in future we have been in exceptional circumstances. There is no question about that. So that is why we have the order the, the motion coming from the executive uh, at such short notice. And under those circumstances, that's the business we're in this morning. Could I move under Standing Order 16 that we delay this debate for seven days on the basis that it is only right and proper that any matter, and not least a matter of this magnitude, should be debated in circumstances where members of this House should have the capacity to propose amendments. And it really is a sad situation if, we're not, if the Executive thinks that this Assembly is a mere tool that they can bounce motions through without any opportunity to amendment. So I do wish to leave to move Understanding Order 16 that we postpone for seven days or sooner. I will look at that now momentarily, and uh, I'll come back in one second. So, members, take your raise for a second.
Okay, members. A motion, uh, members, has been proposed by Minister Alistair that this Assembly adjourns the debate on the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019 to 2020 uh, for seven days. I am content that this motion is in order and will allow up to 30 minutes debate for debate. Members will have a maximum of three minutes to make their comments and should indicate their desire to speak, then foreman officials here at the table. The mover of a motion will have three minutes to propose and three minutes to wind. If the House divides, the vote will be by simple majority. I propose to suspend the sitting for 10 minutes to allow members to make arrangements in relation to speaking on the debate. The Assembly is by leave of the House suspended for 10 minutes.
Okay, members, the sitting is resumed. The next item of business is a motion to delay the debate on the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-2020. The debate will last up to 30 minutes. The proposer will have three minutes to propose and three minutes to wind. All other speakers will have three minutes. Clerk, read the motion. That this Assembly, in accordance with Standing Order 16, adjourns the debate on European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-20 for seven days. I now call on Jim Allister to propose a motion. To move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is a very simple and a very net point. It's an elementary rule of debate in any forum, from a school debating society right through to the most elevated forum in the land, that when a matter such as a motion is being debated, that it can be amended. That is how fora express themselves and finesse the view of any particular forum. It is through amendments that that process is perfected. And yet here we have a proposition that in this House, under the guise of a new approach, the Executive Office bring a motion so late that it cannot be amended. That's the sort of action the Poet Bureau would be proud of. Either we are a properly democratic assembly, so constituted, or we're just a tool of the executive. And if we are a properly a uh, proper debating chamber for Northern Ireland, then we need to have the facility to sift, to debate, and to amend any motion that comes before us. And I think it is astounding that the very first item of motion business in this House, from the most primary functionaries in this House, should be a motion which defies those most fundamental of democratic rules and procedures, and is a motion which cannot, by virtue of the witness with which it was brought, be amended. That cannot be right, Mr Speaker. And therefore, I urge upon this House that we take the time to next Monday, if that's the scheduled date, or an earlier date that would allow amendments, that what do we take the time to follow due process? There's nothing to lose in that, but there's a lot of credibility to lose in not doing that. Thank you. Madam that he's proposing the motion. I so, I so propose. Thank you. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a simple matter. This is the last available time for this House to express an opinion on the content of the European Union Withdrawal Agreement. The Parliament in Scotland has expressed its opinion. The Parliament in Wales, or the Assembly in Wales, will be expressing its opinion on the content of the Withdrawal Agreement tomorrow morning. Uh, so therefore, this is our last available opportunity to express a view. And I speak as someone who was on the same side of the Brexit argument as Mr Allister and who will be happy to vote for this motion because I do not agree to the content of the European Union withdrawal agreement. I don't need to amend this bill or this proposal because it clearly states the view that my party leader and party have expressed. The choice is therefore, do we have a debate on the record in the Assembly uh, that affords all members an opportunity to express their view before the withdrawal agreement passes Parliament at Westminster, or do we forego that opportunity to give a statement of the views of the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland 
um, and allow the withdrawal agreement to go through without our input into that debate at Westminster. This is important. This is the defining uh, issue of the age. And if the suggestion is that the withdrawal agreement should be a done and dusted effort before the Northern Ireland Assembly takes the opportunity to express an opinion on it, then I don't think that that would be a particularly constructive way for us as the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland to proceed. This motion may be great parliamentary japes, but it's doing nothing to serve the people we were sent here to serve. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, Jeremy Ogget, uh, can call you on apologies for not hearing the start of the debate. But while um, to a certain extent I agree with Mr Allister that the Assembly has to be given its place, and that as we move forward, the Assembly and the committees, etc., must carry out their functions uh, with, with impartiality and vigour, there is always going to be an exception to those rules. And given the, the time frames to which we are working to, which have not been set either by the Executive or by the Assembly, then I think the Assembly have little choice but to move forward today and debate and vote upon this motion. Uh, as Mr Stalford said, I suspect there will be different reasons why different parties vote in favour of the motion. There has not been unity on the issue of Brexit across the political parties to date, and I suspect we will not find that today. So every woman will have an opportunity to put on record what their views are in relation to this matter. Um, I, my view or experience has been that uh, the British Government and Westminster have had little regard to what the people here have said about Brexit thus far, and I have no reason to believe they will pay any attention to what we say going into the future. But I do think, given the extraordinary circumstances we are in, that the Assembly should proceed as planned on the order paper. I call Nicola Mallon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are also sympathetic to the arguments being put forward by uh, Mr. Allister, but we haven't had an Assembly in three years. Within that time, the Scottish Assembly has had its say, the Welsh Assembly has had its say, and will again have its say tomorrow. Um, and as other speakers have indicated, the reality is that today is our last opportunity to have our say. And in advance of tomorrow's sitting of the House of Lords, which presents the last opportunity to amend the bill. So yes, while we are sympathetic, these are extraordinary times. And as a result of having no assembly, we are restricted. And today we need to unite and speak with one voice. I call Steve Egan. Much indeed, Mr. Speaker, and I speak with everybody else when we have a lot of sympathy indeed for Mr. Allister's uh, uh, motion and also indeed for what the other speakers have said. But there's something that we need to be very aware of here is that we haven't had sufficient time for debate for this. And there is time before the withdrawal deal goes through in the other House for us to be able to get our position across. We as many other parties have been working very closely with the business community and civil so civic society. And we would have wished amendments to be put into this motion to be able to make the points clear, particularly going through to the withdrawal agreement. So we will be supporting this motion. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'll call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, today feels like caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, while we, have party, uh, while we were part of a cross-party group that wanted an amendment to go forward, we find that the timescales are so tight that we're not allowed to do that. The motion today is absolutely correct. We should um, have been able to have afforded the time to put forward our amendments. Um, however, that is not the case. And as others have indicated, Mr O'Dowd, for, for example, the timescales are against us, set not in this place but by another place. Um, unfortunately, and with a very heavy heart, we cannot agree with Mr Allister today, um, and we will want to go forward with the, the Executive's Office motion. Um, I thank Mr Speaker for writing to the Executive Office. This Assembly needs to be able to amend and to scrutinise appropriately, and thank you for taking that forward. But for today, unfortunately, just because of the time scales, we'll be voting against this motion. Thank you. I call Edwin Poots. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I don't have any sympathy with Mr. Allister on this issue. Uh, what we're seeing here is just pure gra grandstanding and uh, seeking attention. Uh, what we have in front of us is a piece of legislation uh, which is going through Westminster. We're to give an opinion on it. And if we don't give an opinion this week, we won't have the opportunity to give an opinion. So maybe Mr Allister doesn't want to give an opinion on where he stands on the European Union. Our party is very happy to do that, very clear on it, and it's very useful that this Assembly will have the opportunity 
to send a message to Westminster on where it stands on this particular issue. Absolute foolishness not to proceed with this bill today or this motion today to deal with it and allow um, Westminster to hear what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jim Allister to wind. Speaker, what we haven't heard in this debate, of course, is why, if this is a matter of, that's exercised in the executive, why they didn't table this motion on Wednesday? Why they didn't table it on Tuesday? Why did they wait to Friday evening to table this motion, knowing that that prevented amendment? We've had no explanation from the executive, uh, the lead parties in the executive, from the executive office, as to why this motion wasn't tabled in a timely manner. Then we are told it's our last opportunity. Is it? If this House sat on Wednesday, couldn't we debate this matter with amendments? Uh, I, I, the the uh, bill is still in the House of Lords, as I understand it. It has yet to return to the Commons. So I think it's a bit threadbare to say this is the last saloon opportunity. If that was really the thinking, and if there was respect for the processes of this House, then this motion that we are invited to debate would have been tabled long before a 5 o'clock or later on Friday last. It is a contemptible way in which to treat this House, and I trust that members will bear that in mind. The question is that this Assembly, in accordance with Standing Order 16, adjourns the debate on the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-2020 for seven days. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Aye. Aye. No. Clear the lobbies. Clear the lobbies. The House will divide. The question will be put in three minutes. Thank you.
Order, please. Members resume their seats, please. Members resume their seats. Thank you. The question is that this Assembly, in accordance with Standing Order 16, adjourns the debate on the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-20 for seven days. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary. No. Aye. 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 The noes have it. Aye. Aye. Okay, do we have tellers? Okay, members. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the ayes are Jim Allister and Claire Sugden. Tellers for the noes are George Robinson and Sinead Ennis. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Ayes to my right, noes to my left.
Secure the doors.
Okay, members. The chamber. Okay, members. Members will resume their seats, please. Clerk, please read the result. Seventy-six members voted. Fourteen members voted aye. Sixty-two members voted no. The motion is not carried. But the motion is not carried. Unfasten the doors. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, on the order paper. <clears throat> the next item is a motion on the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill 2019-20. Members will be aware that this item was added to the order paper after last week's business committee meeting and a revised order paper issued. And I hope that, as a courtesy to the House, the Minister will give a full explanation for the late tabling of this legislation. The business committee has agreed to allow up to three hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 15 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Clerk, please read the motion. That the Assembly notes the request from the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union for the consent of the Assembly for the provisions of the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which affect its confidence, and affirms that the Assembly does not agree to give its consent. Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I beg to move. Uh, the Secretary of State for Exiting the European Union uh, wrote to us last week and uh, asked that we provided consent to Her Majesty's Government legislating on our behalf in relation to the provisions of the EU Withdrawal Agreement Bill uh, that affect the legislative competence of this Assembly. Firstly, uh, ordinarily, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy First Minister and I would have brought this motion forward within the established uh, time frame, and we are sorry that this was not the case today, as we took the view that it was important to provide members with the earliest possible opportunity to consider this key matter. I do have to say this is the last chance for us to have our views aired in this place. The third reading uh, of the bill is in the House of Lords tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Scotland has already expressed their view. Uh, the Welsh uh, Assembly is debating uh, this tomorrow morning. And we did feel it was important uh, to put this motion down, albeit late, and we accept that, uh, Mr. Speaker, but we did feel it was important that Assembly members were given the opportunity to air their differing, and there will be differing opinions on this matter on, on the floor of the House. And whilst I hear what Mr. Alistair is saying, I do think that it is important that this Assembly uh, puts forward its views, however varied they may be, so that uh, the House of Lords are aware of them tomorrow when they have the third reading. I should start by reminding members as to the nature of the legislation. I think I think I've covered the issues that Mr. Alistair raised in his um, debate. I should start by reminding members as to the nature of the legislative consent process. Uh, in 1998, when devolution took effect in Scotland and Wales, Her Majesty's Government established a convention now known as the Sewell Convention. The Parliament would not normally legislate on devolved matters without the consent of the relevant regional Parliament or Assembly. That convention has generally worked well, but has become controversial in the context of the Brexit issue. Uh, in particular, the Scottish Government and Parliament objected strongly to the UK Parliament taking a power potentially to retain at the United Kingdom level some of the many powers which affect devolved services which are returning to the United Kingdom as a result of us leaving the European Union. Uh, this is our first chance as an Assembly to consider this issue and for some of the aspects of the legislation that were made in the last three years and indeed for some aspects of the current bill the effect of Her Majesty's Government's approach is to limit the role of the devolved administrations in deciding and agreeing policy, though in fairness some of the aspects of the legislation are relatively technical and uncontroversial. Now, as I have indicated, there was insufficient time to bring this matter to the Assembly through the established uh, legislative consent process, but the Deputy First Minister and I felt that it was proper for the Assembly to have its say on the matter. Uh, and in any case, our procedures primarily provide for agreeing to give consent. In this case, the Deputy First Minister and I agree that we should not recommend the consent is that we should recommend the consent is not given, albeit uh, I would say, Mr. Speaker, for different reasons. And hence, the motion we bring to you today. The clauses which the UK government wishes to legislate for on our behalf are outlined in the Secretary of State's letter, a copy of which has been made. Uh, available to members. 
The withdrawal agreement bill will give legal standing to the deal which has been secured by the UK Government with the European Union and upon which the UK will leave the European Union. Members will be familiar with this date. The United Kingdom and the European Union have agreed that the United Kingdom's exit will be followed by a time-limited implementation period, which will last until 31 December in 2020. During the implementation period, European Union law will continue to apply to the UK under the terms set out in the withdrawal agreement. Therefore, new pieces of directly applicable European Union law will continue to apply automatically within the whole of the United Kingdom. The explanatory notes accompanying the Withdrawal Agreement Bill set out the Government's view of the Bill's purpose and main functions. The parts of the Bill with particular relevance to matters within the legislative competence of the Assembly include Part 1, the implementation period, Part 2, remaining implementation of the Withdrawal Agreement, etc. Part 3, citizens' rights, specifically clauses and associated schedules relating to citizens' rights and the establishment and functioning of the Independent Monitoring Authority. Part 4, of particular relevance, are clauses relating to the implementation of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol and the protection of certain rights safeguarded in the Belfast Agreement, as well as those relating to other technical issues such as financial provisions and the implementation of European Union legislation during the implementation period. Members will be well aware that, for various reasons, all parties in the Executive have serious reservations about the deal that has been secured by the United Kingdom Government and, therefore, by extension, the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. The Deputy First Minister and I are in agreement that it would not be in our interest to assent to this request, as it is always preferable that the uh, Assembly legislates for itself. I feel it is important to stress that Parliament and Her Majesty's Government should at all times seek our views on relevant issues. It is fitting, Mr Speaker, that my first statement to the House following the restoration of the Executive deals with an issue on which we are all prepared to work together to advance the interests of Northern Ireland, irrespective of our political views. The amendments to the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, supported by local MPs, from across the political spectrum have demonstrated that the will is there for different parties to work together in the best interests of our people and businesses. As an executive, we will work together to represent the concerns of all our citizens and ensure that our voice is heard. And I do commend the many business organisations that have been working with political parties across the spectrum uh, to try and find amendments which uh, uh, in the end of the day weren't taken by the government but I think they demonstrated that there was cross-party agreement in relation to those amendments. Now, we recognise that the United Kingdom government is determined to press ahead with the withdrawal agreement bill irrespective of whether we give our consent but in our view this will have a significant impact on our devolution settlement. We will be making it clear that with the restoration of the executive and the commitment of all parties to work together, the government must recognise our devolution settlement and should not normally legislate in the devolved space without consent. Our priority for Brexit is to ensure that the needs of Northern Ireland are understood and are reflected as we move forward. Our unique position in that we are the only region of the United Kingdom which will have a land border with the European Union requires very specific solutions to protect and enhance trade. And while the Withdrawal Agreement Bill provides powers to implement the protocol, the New Decade New Approach document goes further and indeed includes further commitments from the United Kingdom Government. We understand that the detailed arrangements will be contained in future secondary legislation and will secure some of the main points on which our MPs had agreed in the amendments that were not made in the comments debate two weeks ago. We will therefore be making representation to Her Majesty's Government that it is imperative that it fulfils all of its commitments and that we are involved in an early stage on any policy discussions around future legislation brought forward under the powers provided by the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. And while the Withdrawal Agreement Bill is likely 
<clears throat> to be implemented by the United Kingdom Government, this is not the end of the matter. There are a number of important areas in which we require clarity from the Government in relation to the deal it has agreed with the European Union, and in particular, the Protocol. In terms of trade between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, which of course is of vital importance to everyone, we must have unfettered access to the Great Britain market. The Prime Minister promised that this would be the case throughout his campaign for re-election, and he must deliver on his promise. It is essential that our businesses do not face additional barriers to trade, such as tariffs, administrative costs or delays, and that their competitiveness is maintained. Specifically, we welcome the commitment from our government that it will ensure that Northern Ireland remains part of the United Kingdom internal market and legislation will be in place to guarantee unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses to the whole of the UK and that this will be enforced for the 1st of January 2021. We will now be engaging with the government to ensure that this is delivered upon in the necessary time frame. Now, our businesses, as I have acknowledged already, have raised concerns about the potential for discrimination against Northern Ireland goods and businesses accessing the GB market, particularly if there should be regulatory divergence in the future. To grow uh, the economy in Northern Ireland, our businesses need clarity, and we will be strongly pressing the government to provide this throughout the process as we exit the European Union. It is also essential that trade can continue in both directions and that Great Britain businesses are not discouraged from operating in Northern Ireland due to new burdens. The various committees outlined in the protocol play a very important role and the decisions they take will have a long-lasting consequence for Northern Ireland. We have secured a commitment that our representatives will be part of any UK delegations in any meetings of the UK-EU specialised or joint committees discussing Northern Ireland specific matters, which are also being attended by the Republic of Ireland's government as part of the European Union's delegation. It is only right that we are included in these discussions, and we will ensure that our views are properly presented to the relevant decision makers. Despite having secured numerous commitments and guarantees from the government, we are still of the view that the deal that is being pursued by the UK government poses significant challenges for Northern Ireland, because it should be for the Assembly to legislate for matters within our competence, uh, because it, that's the way it should be. We bring forward the motion today seeking agreement from the Assembly that it does not give its consent to the request from the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. The letter from the Secretary of State, Steve Barclay, and the details of the clauses have been provided to members. And given the very limited time we have to respond and the expectation that the government is going to proceed with the bill, I would suggest that our debate today, although I cannot order people what they want to say, but I, should, I suggest that we should focus on the issue of principle rather than attempting to scrutinise the detailed clauses in the bill. And it will be a matter that we take a stand on uh, as a newly restored Assembly to show that we are back in business, we are representing the views of our constituents and that our views and policies should be respected and not uh, overruled uh, by the UK Parliament and Government. Although I do recognise, uh, Mr Speaker, that if the bill goes ahead tomorrow in the House of Lords, there's very lim limited time for them to take account of our views. However, the Deputy First Minister and I felt it was very important that the Assembly was given the opportunity to air those views, and that's why we brought the, the motion to you. And again, I apologise to you and to the Business Committee that we could not have done so in a more timely manner, and we look forward to receipt uh, of your letter on that issue. So, in summing up then, Mr Speaker, I commend this motion uh, to the Assembly. I hope it gives members the opportunity to air their views on this issue, and I look forward to the debate. Thank you. I call on the Committee for the Executive Office Chairperson, Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I wish to speak briefly as the Chair of the Executive Office Committee. Um, for obvious reasons, there hasn't been any committee consideration um, of the devolved provisions included in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, so there is no committee position. Um, although I think it is safe to say that had the committee been in place, there would have been significant scrutiny under the legislative consent procedure on those provisions which alter the competence of this Assembly. And as the First Minister has outlined, 
that has not, it has not been possible, uh, meaning that the way in which this issue has been dealt with today has been unavoidable, and we understand that. However, I am confident also uh, uh, that this would have been treated given the cross Northern Ireland Party support in Westminster for the amendments to the bill that would have been supported by those who, uh, all those parties there and those that don't take their seat or don't have seats there. But speaking in my capacity as an MLA, I would call for the rejection uh, of consent for this bill. Um, across the North over the last three years, Brexit has sharpened all of the lines that the Good Friday Agreement helped to soften uh, on borders, sovereignty and identity. Uh, we should have spent the last three years since June 2016 talking about tackling poverty, about creating opportunity and reconciling our island. And instead, we have talked exclusively about Brexit, uh, a problem that did not need to exist and that we didn't consent to. Now, we in the SDLP have been proudly pro-European since our foundation almost 50 years ago. Our founder, John Hume, talked about the European Union as the world's greatest peace process, and our European identity has been woven through the politics of the SDLP ever since. We campaigned hard against Brexit, and we do not believe that there is a good version of Brexit. While we believe firmly that nothing is as good as remaining would be, this deal is particularly challenging and destructive for people in the North. It does not protect our interests in the way that the backstop would have done, and it has united members across this House in opposition. Now, there are various political views and positions on the matter of Brexit, but there is collective agreement that any hindrance to trade, East or West, is not good for business here and will introduce an additional layer of bureaucracy that business can ill afford to manage. I think it is positive that, albeit for our different motivations, we have a collective political voice in this matter in this House, and we can show our political maturity in this issue by setting the politics aside and working together for the business community out there. I hope this sends a positive message to them. The withdrawal bill is laced with uncertainty and ambiguity, and there is a clear lobby from the business sector here that they want just the opposite. They want to know exactly how business will be transacted, and in the absence of such clarity, they have worries, and we share in those worries and those concerns. Politically, we believe that Brexit, in whatever form, is not good for Ireland. The imposition of borders, be they fiscal or trade, hard or soft, the overwhelming consensus is that they are not good. We must do all that we can to mitigate against the worst ex excesses of Brexit and ensure that we are on the side of business and trade sectors. They have been a powerful voice of reality in the midst of much noise of late. But their needs must be what we focus on now. And I hope that the withholding of our consent for this bill will send a, a message to the British Tory government that we do not agree with it and that it must be improved. I hope that such a collective rejection of the bill here will send the message to Prime Minister Johnson that we want to see that unfettered access for trade and no imposition of additional borders, costs or delays when conducting trade from the North. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm tempted to open with, as I was saying before I was interrupted three years ago, but maybe it's too soon. I think it's important that we state uh, on the record of this House what the Prime Minister himself said. If we wanted to vary regulation, then we would have to leave Northern Ireland behind as an economic semi-colony of the European Union. We would be damaging the fabric of the Union. Those are the words of the Prime Minister, spoken before he became the Prime Minister, when he was denouncing Theresa May for the content of her withdrawal agreement. And yet, and yet, the aegis that he warned against is exactly that which he now proposes to sign this part of the United Kingdom up to. In those circumstances, I think it's absolutely right that this House should say that we are not prepared to tolerate such a situation. During the absence of devolution, there have been many twists and turns in this Brexit process. 
Even in Northern Ireland, we have had three Secretaries of State over the course of devolution being down. Two Prime Ministers. But from a DUP perspective, we have had one guiding principle in relation to the issue of Brexit. And that is that Northern Ireland must leave the European Union on the same basis as the rest of the United Kingdom. When it was suggested to put a border up the Irish Sea, both Theresa May and Boris Johnson have stated that that was a prospect that no British Prime Minister could sign up to. I call upon them, therefore, I call upon Boris, therefore, to maintain his word and his consistency. And it's important that going forward, the executive adopts a collective approach to make sure that that is the case. I think the Prime Minister should be congratulated. I think this is the first time, certainly in my living memory, that I've seen the Northern Ireland Assembly is united on an issue in rejecting the content and withholding our consent for the content of the treaty that he signed up to. This deal is bad for Northern Ireland economically because it hives us off from our single biggest market. And it will be the responsibility of the executive going forward to ensure that there are no barriers to east-west trade. I want to see the outcome of the referendum delivered. But Northern Ireland cannot be a dowry for delivering Brexit for Great Britain. And the Prime Minister needs to be made very much aware of that. I believe in devolution. I believe that devolution is worth having. And it helps us to address the unique circumstances that do exist in Northern Ireland. And we have to work together in order to do that. By attempting to shunt this piece of legislation through without the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly, it runs contrary to everything that my right honourable friend, the First Minister, said that pertains in the Sewell Convention. I think I probably finish my remarks with a quote from the First Minister. On Brexit, we will not give support to the government when we, when we believe they are fundamentally wrong and acting in a way that is detrimental to Northern Ireland and taking us in the wrong direction. We will oppose them and we will use our votes. Let me say clearly from this platform today that we do not support a deal that, work, that does not work for Northern Ireland as well as the whole of the United Kingdom. That is our position and we have maintained it consistently throughout this process. The Prime Minister, for whatever reason, may have chosen to change his position, but we will not. It is essential that all parties now pull together to defend the economic interests of Northern Ireland, to defend our businesses and our traders all of whom will be damaged or hurt if uh, the vision outlined by the Prime Minister comes to pass. And so on behalf of our party, I'm clear in saying that we want to work with everyone to ensure the best possible outcome in this, the defining political issue of our age. Thank you. I call Conor Murphy. It's, it's an interesting debate so far in that we find ourselves in partial agreement with each other. Uh, and I suppose from the, uh, the contribution so far, there's a clear recognition of the damage that Brexit can do to here. And what a pity that that recognition, which was first put in a joint letter from the current First Minister and the, the late Deputy First Minister, Martin McGuinness, then didn't become the consistent position over the last three years. Because I think we're now back at that place where we recognise that the Brexit ambitions of the British government are damaging to the people that we represent here. Uh, and this has been a divisive debate ever since that. Uh, I sincerely hope we can get back to that. But one consistent point through it all has been that the majority of the people in this jurisdiction are opposed to Brexit. They stated so in the referendum, and they have stated so in numerous elections since, and numerous opinion polls. And that continues to be, if not that position, even a stronger position, that people are opposed uh, to Brexit. And I think they did so because there's a broad recognition across the community, as, as has been expressed here today, that the idea that has been pursued by a British government is damaging to our interests. And it's not leaving the European Union is not in the interest of the people who live here. The EU guarantees rights. It facilitates a soft border and it underpins the all-Ireland economy. 
and we are EU critical, unlike our, our colleagues here. Uh, there is much wrong with the European Union, much wrong in terms of its approach, in terms of the desire to centralise things and desire to have common defence and common foreign policies. There are many things about the European Union that we disagree with and we use our position within the European Parliament uh, and as elected representatives here to oppose some of the direction of the European Union. But there's no doubt that overall the, uh, the membership of the European Union has been good for this island and continues to be good for this island. It's part of the identity, particularly of the younger generation come forward, who see themselves very much as European as well as whatever particular identities they hold on this island. It's also important to remember at a time when we are struggling to get the British government to live up to the financial commitments that it made as part of the, the deal to resurrect these institutions, uh, that the EU is a significant contributor to our public finances. Uh, the cap payments alone amounted to 2.1 billion between 2014 and 2020. Those are vital for keeping many of our farms sustainable. You know, we have, I'm sure, many large farms, but the vast bulk of people involved in farming in this part of Ireland are small farmers who are very much reliant on EU subsidies to keep those farms viable. We have some limited guarantee, I think, until 2021 in relation to the future uh, of spending or similar spend that, that CAP would provide, but nothing beyond that. And there's a huge question mark in the agricultural community and the farming community over how sustainable small farms will be uh, on the other side of a reduction of, of all of that. There's also, of course, inter-egg funding, which has been hugely important, particularly in border areas, both sides of the border, that were neglected under almost 70 years of partition uh, from investment, particularly in the infrastructure, and in turn that infrastructure and investment has led to economic uh, advantage growing for people in the border communities, uh, communities that were practically ignored throughout the history of both states on this island. So that's been a huge uh, contributor uh, to, to ensuring that the, the, not only the, the infrastructure funds from Europe, but contribute also to, to the opening up of the border following the entry into the single market and customs union. And there are the competitive funds. Uh, all of which have been jeopardised uh, by Brexit. We're, we are told that there is some guarantee in relation to peace funding, which is specific to here and to the, the six counties here and the six border counties as well. And I sincerely hope that that does continue, because again, that has been in the absence of a peace dividend, which we were promised in 1998, history repeated itself somehow, uh, that has been very important to try and help communities which suffered as a con cause, uh, consequence of the conflict uh, and communities on the other side of the border which suffered from that lack of investment that I've, I talked about uh, in relation to inter funding. It allowed those people to access funding which hadn't previously been agreed to it. So th those are all hugely important and that's why when the Brexit issue came up ourselves and we joined forces with the SDLP, the Alliance and the Greens, we opposed Brexit. We made sure our voices were heard in Europe. We worked through our MEPs. We worked with the Irish government and we made sure that the interests of the people that we represent were on the agenda for the European Union because they weren't on the agenda for the British government. So we will continue to oppose Brexit. I think it's important that we say here today that this uh, Assembly rejects uh, the, the Brexit uh, propositions of the British government. We do not consent to them. We continue to do that. We continue to represent the best interests of the people we represent because we know that our interests are not in any way featuring in the British government's approach to Brexit. It is English nationalist interests which dominate that agenda, and it's important that we continue to reject that with every voice that we have. Cora Margaret. Can I now call on Meg Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I um, retain a significant sympathy for Mr. Allister's position that we're being forced uh, to vote uh, on a binary uh, proposition, uh, which actually leaves us no actual choice the Ulster Unionist Party believe we will have to support uh, today's motion. But we do so uh, hoping that <clears throat> the idea that we are in a new decade with a new approach will be reflected with perhaps some humility by some members and parties in this chamber. And if that's too much of an ask, perhaps at least with some acknowledgement that previous confidences uh, were based on pretty shallow ground. In 2016, before uh, the collapse of devolution in a debate uh, on Brexit. Uh, Mr. Putz made it very clear, uh, and I quote him, we are in a negotiation period and that negotiation will be led by our national government. I'm proud to be part of the United Kingdom and to put my faith in our national government. 
We will be involved in those negotiations and we will deal with Theresa May, Boris Johnson, David Davies and the key people. So well dealt with that we're now about to vote against one of the key proposals from our national government. Uh, that debate was on our, our document, a vision for Northern Ireland outside of the European Union. Uh, this was rejected by the House. It was a document which said we should deliver a positive vision for the people of Northern Ireland post-Brexit, that we should have a, a war room with skills and capacity uh, to game the policy options, and we should define our key asks of Her Majesty's Government. And the first key ask was to triple infrastructure investment. It was derided and poo-pooed by this House, but here we are in 2020, and one of the key priorities of the UK Government is what? Investment in infrastructure, and we are to benefit to the tune of £1 billion by Barnet Consequentials because of investment uh, in infrastructure. And yet, interestingly, in deriding the notion, uh, because he's now the Finance Minister, it was Conor Murphy, uh, whose criticism of our document was this. It is predicated on the generosity of the British government. What a pity he didn't remember those words when he was negotiating new decade, new approach. And, and let me diverge for a second, Mr. Speaker, just to put on record, because many people are asking why the smaller parties didn't ensure the financial package was right for new decade, new approach. The Ulster Unionist Party were halfway through our first read of the document uh, when Secretary of State Smith and Tony Sikovny were briefing the media. So we had no opportunity because we had been closed out. Uh, another key ask, uh, by the way, of our document was no hard border at Great Britain's ports and airports, just to put that back on the record. We remain the most affected region of the United Kingdom by Brexit, and we remain the least prepared. The longer it goes on, the more uh, Theresa May's famous Brexit means Brexit quote is as meaningless as lunch means lunch. But it seems for Northern Ireland, lunch increasingly looks like uh, a ham and cheese sandwich from the local gas station uh, and not three courses at one of our Michelin star uh, restaurants. Uh, Mr. Stolford, interestingly, uh, said back in that debate in 2016, uh, that those of us on the Remain campaign are exhibiting a public display of the five stages of grief. Denial, yeah. anger, yeah. bargaining, yeah. depression, yeah. and finally, acceptance. And this motion is an acceptance of the failure to deliver on the promises of 2016. Uh, in June 2016, Mrs Foster said Brexit she told this House, Brexit offers the opportunity uh, for ambition, innovation, flexibility and imagination. Uh, and I, in the same debate, said I feared, as a prophet of doom, uh, that Brexit meant an era of uncertainty that will last for years, not months. Three and a half years on, who was right? Thank you. Uh, I now call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. <coughs> Alliance continues to be a pro-European party. We believe that Northern Ireland should be part of the EU and that there's no such thing as a good or sensible Brexit. Northern Ireland will be worse off under all Brexit scenarios. That said, we accept that Brexit is now inevitable in less than two weeks' time. And we now need to focus on taking the rough edges off the Brexit deal and standing up and protecting Northern Ireland. Our society only works based on sharing and interdependence, yet all forms of Brexit entail some degree of friction, boundaries or borders. That risks a perception of winners and losers. Our economy is integrated in terms of both sales and supply chains on a north, south and east, west basis, and it's wrong to see either avenue being compromised. The Theresa May deal provided a more credible soft landing. By contrast, the Johnson deal is much more challenging. 
Northern Ireland does need a special deal to address our particular circumstances. We should not fear Northern Ireland being different. The core challenge is how that difference is, is managed. The withdrawal agreement bill itself raises a number of problems. First, there is uncertainty that a trade deal with the EU or a wider future relationship can be reached within the next 11 months. At best, this might be a mere fig leaf. This creates a significant risk of a no-deal outcome for the UK with particular implications for us here in Northern Ireland. Second, the nature of that future relationship is unclear. The Chancellor has re recently stressed that UK will not actively align with the EU. This will have implications for any, any Irish Sea interface. Third, the bill has a significant impact on devolved powers and competencies. This is the main thrust of the motion from the FMDFM. Fourth, and related to that, there is set to be extensive use of the so-called Henry VIII powers and other deleted powers granted to UK ministers to shape outcomes without accountability and scrutiny. The passage of this motion by the Assembly today is set to be constitutionally significant. We have been asked by the UK Government to pass a legislative consent motion as is required under the Sewell Convention. The Assembly is set to say no. The Scottish Parliament has already said no, and we've heard today the Welsh Assembly Government are to debate it tomorrow. But the UK Government is set to proceed regardless. Moreover, there are many unresolved issues for Northern Ireland. The joint amendment that was not permitted by a cross-party um, group sought to capture and address many of those issues. Positively, we have seen some progress via UK commitments to Northern Ireland being represented on the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee when we're being discussed, and to legislate to guarantee unfettered access from Northern Ireland to Great Britain. However, it is unclear how both of these commitments will be met in practice. The UK Government needs to go further and to give commitments to the specific points in the amendment, and we hope to bring that forward at some other stage. It is worth an making some points in the wider context. First, we should not tolerate a trade-off between some sort of interface on the island of Ireland or having the interface down the Irish Sea. Second, the focus of current debate is largely on the interface between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. However, the Great Britain to Northern Ireland interface is just as important and indeed more complicated. Its nature largely depends on the nature of the free trade agreement. Indications here so far are not good. But even a more benign FTA is not the same as a customs union and a single market. Third, there's an ambiguity on Northern Ireland's future trade relationships. Rather than what could have originally been a foot in both camps, we could now end up being a marginal in both the UK and EU arrangements. Finally, it's important that the shape of the future relationship doesn't just cover goods, but also services and the movement of people. In conclusion, there is a gap between rhetoric declarations and promises of the UK ministers and reality. Therefore, Alliance confirms our support for the motion that's been brought forward today, and we do not agree for this Assembly to give us consent. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr Paul Gibbon. Mr Speaker, uh, I rise to support the motion tabled by the uh, Executive Office. Uh, the referendum that was held on uh, the EU uh, was a UK-wide referendum, uh, has been debated at length, uh, and indeed uh, we could spend time rehearsing the old arguments and seeking to have uh, another battle on, on an issue uh, that has now uh, been completed. I think we are best spending our energy looking uh, to the future uh, as to how we can deal with the new reality that we're facing. Uh, I, of course, accept uh, Northern Ireland did uh, vote to remain within uh, the EU. However, uh, that was part of a uh, UK national uh, question, and so uh, we must accept that, uh, given our place within uh, the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, during the uh, discussions that have been taking place, uh, a lot of focus, uh, understandably, uh, was made of the relationships on an all-Ireland basis, uh, the implications for the movement of people, for trade, uh, north-south on this island, uh, and uh, a lot of attention was paid by that, uh, civic society, uh, a lot of the uh, business groups and different interested stakeholders, indeed from uh, nationalist uh, politicians. Uh, and I believe that uh, my concern at the time that uh, viewing the relationships of the outworking of Brexit through a nationalist uh, constitutional lens uh, would then lead to the problems that we now encounter as a result of the withdrawal bill. And so the withdrawal bill uh, ensures that there won't be any 
uh, friction between north-south, uh, that uh, those trading relationships uh, will be able to continue. However, there are now issues for the east-west uh, dimension in terms of our trading uh, relationship. And so when we look at the Northern Ireland Protocol that is uh, contained within uh, the withdrawal bill, uh, it does cause uh, our party uh, concern. Northern Ireland uh, will be required uh, to align uh, with uh, single market uh, regulations. Uh, there will be enforcement and compliance carried out by the European Commission, by uh, the European Court of Justice. Uh, these are issues that uh, won't be faced uh, elsewhere uh, in the United Kingdom and Great Britain. And so we will have a dual tariff regime in place because the joint committee that is being established as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, requires goods to be identified as being at risk. So where there is trade east-west, uh, if there is a risk that that could then end up uh, within the European Union, there will have to be a tariff uh, paid for that. That inevitably requires checks and compliance to be carried out. That is going to put increased burdens upon our business uh, community. When I look at the consent mechanism then that is built in as to how we will ever extract ourselves from this new relationship, it turns the Belfast Agreement upon its head. I have noted the uh, justification for this by the UK Government is because this is uh, an international agreement and therefore the consent mechanism does not need to be the same as what it is within this House when it comes to dealing with domestic issues that are controversial. And so that consent mechanism is going to build in tension within this place, not immediately, uh, but further down the line in the years ahead, uh, there will be problems for this House as to how that consent mechanism is to be uh, carried out. I will give way. Uh, can I first of all welcome the member back to the House and congratulate him on his recent appointment. And, uh, will, will the member agree with me that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, and uh, the Tory government can obviously not be trusted when it comes to these matters of debate in relation to Northern Ireland's future in the European Union, and also general matters in relation to this place, as we have seen from most recent behaviour? Well, the, the member brings me on to my final point. Um, the Prime Minister has made commitments, given the context that I have set out about the concerns that we have around the implications for East-West and how that will interface uh, for Northern Ireland businesses. The Prime Minister has made commitments uh, of unwavering commitment to Northern Ireland. He said this new deal in the bill ensures that the United Kingdom will leave the EU whole and entire with an unwavering dedication to Northern Ireland's place in our union. Uh, the Prime Minister also indicated uh, that we will have unfettered access when it comes to trade. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. The Prime Minister also indicated that uh, we will have unfettered access. So, Words have been uh, made clear by the Prime Minister, which we could take comfort from, commitments made in the Conservative manifesto to that effect. However, when we look at the bill, there is no mention of unf unfettered access in the bill. It does not exist. When we look at the regulations to facilitate access to GB market for Northern Ireland, it says ministers may regulate. It does not say must. And that is why our party, with the support of other parties, brought forward amendments. And I want to put on my record my appreciation for those parties that tabled amendments so that unfettered access, the requirement to regulate for that, uh, we sought to put that into the withdrawal bill. That, however, uh, was rejected by the House of Commons. So those commitments by the Prime Minister, by the UK Government, need to be given legal effect. They need to bite when it comes to the future relationship for Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom and also for that north-south dimension. I want the best of both worlds. That is good for our politics, it is good for our people, it is good for our businesses. But there needs to be much more work carried out to ensure that happens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call uh, Kiva Archibald. Um, in speaking in support of this motion rejecting consent, I think it is important to continually emphasise that we are being dragged out of the European Union against the democratically expressed wishes of the majority of the people of the North. In fact, on a number of occasions since 2016, that rejection of Brexit has been reaffirmed, most recently in the European elections in May, when two out of three MEPs elected were pro-Remain, and in the Westminster election last month, when the majority of MPs elected were anti-Brexit. The withdrawal agreement between the European Union and the British Government 
does contain the protocol in Ireland, which gives some certainty preventing a hard border on the island of Ireland. But it is far from an ideal arrangement, and no matter what is agreed before the end of this year, it will be suboptimal to what we currently enjoy. The sections of the withdrawal agreement referring to the North are as noteworthy for the lack of detail as for what they actually do contain. It is unclear how the customs and VAT arrangements will actually work, and of course there is much uh, that depends on the trading arrangements that are still to be negotiated out. At the weekend, however, the British Chancellor Sajid Javid, commenting on regulatory divergence, says, There will not be alignment, we will not be a rule taker, we will not be in the single market, and we will not be in the customs union. If these comments are anything to go by, there is likely to be a considerable negative impact, and particularly so for businesses and those that rely on regulatory alignment, um, like our agri-food sector. The British Chancellor then had the audacity to suggest that businesses should be prepared for the imminent changes, despite the continuing absence of clarity on the conditions that they will be trading under. I think it is important at this point that we pay tribute to all of those various representative bodies from across the North, from business, trade unions, farming organisations and community and voluntary sector who have come together over the past couple of years to speak with a clear and united voice about the need to protect the interests of the North. Because what is clear is that regardless of the outcome for Brexit, it is going to have a detrimental impact across every sector of our society for many years to come. And when we hear comments like those of the British Chancellor, it is clear that he has little thought for the impact on his own economy, never mind ours. When we add to this the disgraceful bad faith displayed by the British Government in relation to its financial commitments to the new decade, new, new approach deal, is it any wonder that more and more people are coming to realise that the British Government has no positive contribution to our future well-being and prosperity? Uh, thank you. Uh, Gary Milton. Mr Speaker, and I rise to join with colleagues in supporting uh, this motion tabled by the Executive Office. Uh, we're now three years on from the referendum uh, having taken place uh, since the people of the United Kingdom at that time uh, voted to leave the European Union. Of course, as Democrats, we strongly believe that the result of the referendum should be delivered and the voices of the electorate should be respected. Uh, today is very much a welcome opportunity for all of us here in the Chamber uh, to give our views and our perspective, uh, particularly on giving consent um, to, to uh, the UK Government. My party has long held the view and continues to hold the view that Northern Ireland and the entire UK uh, will have a bright future outside of the European Union. It was the New Decade New Approach Agreement that brought this House back. Uh, in that agreement, uh, the UK Government made a number of commitments. Uh, th these can be summarised in four broad points. The UK Government, having already committed to ensuring that there is a new deal for Northern Ireland as we leave the EU, maximising trade opportunities and investment. There is a commitment that Northern Ireland remains an integral part of the UK internal market and that NI remains in the UK customs territory. There is a further commitment to legislate to guarantee unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses uh, to the whole of the UK internal market, with legislation in force for the 1st of January 2021. And there is finally an aim to maximise the free flow of trade and a, and a commitment to ensure that Northern Ireland businesses benefit from the UK's new free trade agreements signed with other countries. Mr Speaker, all of this is very much welcome. However, it is disappointing that when the opportunity does, did arise uh, just days ago in the House of Commons, the opportunity arose when MPs from this place joined together uh, and put forward amendments that would have ensured the access would be truly unfettered on the movement of goods both on an east-west and west-east basis. That was opposed uh, and not allowed to progress uh, by the government. The checks, as proposed, would lead to greater burdens for trade between GB and Northern Ireland and consequentially would have a negative impact for consumers. So despite the fact that Northern Ireland trades more significantly with GB than it does with the Republic of Ireland, the EU and the rest of the world combined, the current proposals would see our east-west trade subject to the rules of the EU Customs Union, notwithstanding that uh, Northern Ireland would remain part of the UK Customs Territory. So the Prime Minister has described his withdrawal agreement as of and ready, but it's very clear from this chamber and from business and stakeholders that there's no appetite uh, for the current withdrawal agreement. 
So on our part, the Democratic Unionist Party will continue to work to shape a solution in Northern Ireland's interests. It is important that the new Northern Ireland Executive is represented in the UK delegations to the EU going forward. And finally, as at every stage of the process, the Democratic Unionist Party will judge each situation on what is best for Northern Ireland economically and con constitutionally within the Union. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I would now call Karen Mullen and would remind members that uh, this is the first opportunity for Karen Mullen to speak as a private member and would remind people that at this convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption. In speaking uh, in support of this motion, the EU-British Brexit deal undoubtedly contains essential protections for the island of Ireland, preventing any hardening of the border. But it is, in reality, the least worst option because there is no good Brexit. The majority of people here voted to remain in the EU. We do not support Brexit and we do not consent to Brexit. In addition, while the Brexit mitigations for Ireland contained in the withdrawal agreement are essential, we still need greater protections for young people and indeed all of us who are EU citizens. I want to focus on education and the implications of Brexit for our young people. Last Wednesday in the House of Commons, 344 MPs voted against a clause that would have required the British government to negotiate continuing full membership of the Erasmus programme after Brexit. The Erasmus scheme is an EU programme that afforded our students the opportunity to study in all our countries. The impact of Brexit on education removes that option and will mean that people from the North will have to pay higher tuition fees if they wish to attend university in the EU. Such changes could put university attendance out of financial reach for many of our young people. There is no doubt that for students, for the students, young people, those in training and staff who work in the education sector, the Erasmus scheme has been appreciated and beneficial for those who have availed of it. But at the end of the year, regardless of a trade deal, that option will be gone. The Erasmus programme has been acknowledged as a tremendous success for many young people, and I would strongly argue that the benefits of the programme will be very difficult to replicate. The loss of Erasmus will impact most on those from disadvantaged backgrounds and those with medical needs or disabilities. I urge members here today to send a strong message to the British government that you do not have our consent to remove our citizens from the European Union. Thank you. And I call Nicola Mullen. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Brexit is the biggest challenge of our time and it will affect generations to come across these islands. Since the referendum on the EU membership in 2016, the politics of Brexit has dominated and consumed the past three years. Time that should have been spent dealing with poverty, inequality, the crises in our health service, our schools and the climate emergency. I recognise, Mr Speaker, that there are different views in this chamber, from those who are passionately remain to those who support leave. But I wholeheartedly welcome the fact that after three years we are in this chamber and we are respectfully debating our differences rather than outside engaged in megaphone diplomacy over the airwaves. Mr Speaker, there is no escaping the facts. 56% of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union. That vote has been reinforced with further support for Remainers in the subsequent European and Westminster elections. People understand and recognise that Brexit is the most significant economic, constitutional and social challenge facing us across these islands. Democratically, they have made their will clear again. People across the North are not prepared to suffer economic ruin. They are not prepared to accept wholesale sell-off of our health service in a border between Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. Nor are they prepared to accept declining food and environmental standards. Today is our opportunity to reinforce the message of the electorate that we represent. Today we can and we must give the people of Northern Ireland back a voice. Today we must send a united message to Boris Johnson and the UK Government, to Dublin and to Brussels, that collectively we reject the EU Withdrawal Agreement Bill. Today we can choose not to be divided by our views on EU membership, 
Instead, we can choose to unite, respecting those differences, and together vote to reject the withdrawal bill, because it does not protect the interests of all the people we represent. Without question, this legislation offers nothing but economic self-harm and damage to the hard-won progress we have made over 20 years. It opens old wounds and it threatens business, investment and jobs. Critically, this legislation, as drafted, provides no certainty or security for our future. As the British Government has recklessly ruled out an extension to the transition period, it still threatens the possibility of a catastrophic no-deal Brexit. It is not Boris Johnson and his Cabinet colleagues, Mr Speaker, who will suffer as a result of this dangerous cliff edge. It will be communities, farmers and businesses right across Northern <coughs> Ireland. Today again, the SDLP calls on the British Government to immediately rule out any future threat of a no-deal Brexit. Mr Speaker, people at home are rightly concerned. They know, given the catalogue of experiences to date, that the words of the Prime Minister Boris Johnson cannot be trusted. Moving even beyond the falsehoods of the Vote Leave campaign, following his election to office, the Prime Minister ripped apart our insurance policy, the backstop. Yet today, his government seeks our consent for this EU withdrawal agreement that will leave the North clinging to a broken Brexit Britain, left to suffer its inevitable and punishing fate of economic self-harm without adequate protections. That is why SDLP MPs with Alliance and DUP MPs proposed a series of amendments to protect all our interests in Westminster. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party may have a majority in the House of Commons, but that does not remove power and responsibility from this place. The SDLP continues to believe that the best solution is for Northern Ireland to remain a full member of the European Union. As our former leader and civil rights champion John Hume put it, the European Union is the best example in the history of the world of conflict resolution. Yes. Except that if that were the case, that would be a breach of the Belfast Agreement, and Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom would be changed. So will she accept that even this proposal of Boris Johnson is changing uh, what was agreed and, and is uh, not following the Belfast Agreement? And uh, what she is proposing will actually uh, be opposed by unionists because we are part of the United Kingdom, even though we dislike what is being proposed in this Boris Johnson deal. I, I and the thank, member has a further minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank um, the, the member for his comments. As I go on, I will po point out how the, actually the Good Friday Agreement is the answer to a lot of the challenges that we will see and presents the key to unlocking the opportunities. Uh, for our communities, the European Union has provided support and stability. It has maximised rights and protected freedoms to move across these islands. It has supported the Good Friday Agreement, the ensuring that no... Yes. Yeah, just very briefly on that very point, um, as part of all that, and we live and represent areas and communities where many other EU nationals live and work, and in recognition of that very positive contribution to our society, in our schools, in our workplace and all that, it's crucially important that the rights and protections of those citizens be inserted in and enshrined in legislation too. Yes, I very much agree with that point, and the SDLP maintains that the best protections and solutions to the challenges we now face are contained within the Good Friday Agreement and its three strands of relationships across these islands. In closing, Mr Speaker, I want to urge members across the Chamber to support the motion to withhold legislative consent. Whatever our views on membership of the European Union, our job now is to unite in common purpose to best protect people. We have already seen collective leadership from politicians of all parties in one approach with the business community in Westminster. That approach must continue. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan. And just to echo the comments made by everybody else today, the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, we're rising. To, I'm rising to support the motion. Um, indeed, the comments from the Chancellor at the weekend in the Financial Times underpin how much Northern Ireland is now likely to verge from the rest of our country. The implications, particularly on the Irish Sea border, are significant. However, no one seems to be or even ring to really care about the practical implications that that will may be. Indeed, the discussions that were had by the party leaders with the Secretary of State less than a week ago, when we were sitting around the table, nobody seemed to be aware of the significance of the changes that are going to, be, going to occur. Nobody seemed to understand the quantum 
and the amount of work and effort that needs to go into trying to achieve where we're going to. Indeed, earlier on, this, or earlier on last week, with conversations with senior EU and UK political leaders, show that Northern Ireland is rapidly sliding down the priority list. There is little or no focus on making this agreement work. And that has massive political potential costs and regulation being passed on to our businesses, our consumers, our agriculture and our fishing sectors. Unfortunately, the implications of all this were and are sadly predictable. Looking specifically at the withdrawal bill, the withdrawal bill puts the withdrawal agreement into UK law. The withdrawal agreement will affect Northern Ireland in perpetuity, not just in relation to the EU, but also in relation to the rest of our country when it comes into past. The withdrawal bill will be a piece of legislation that will be built upon in the future in order to manage the domestic implications of this protocol. This can be expected to take the form of statutory instruments which, will, which the government will lay down. Northern Ireland will have very little influence and virtually absolutely no hope in a nolly. The withdrawal bill provides extraordinary power to the UK executive over areas of potential devolved competence. The power of the Northern Ireland Executive and Assembly is directly constrained by this bill. It is notable that the concerns that have been expressed by the business community and the political parties and were given considerable cross-party support within the New Decade New De Approach document do not seem to have been supported by what has been going on in Westminster, particularly by the government. And although it was a welcome and considerable step forward, particularly of the New Decade New Approach and particularly the approach from all the parties, this mainly took the form of government commitment to consult. Who here believes that the current British government is going to do much in the way of consulting? And how this is done and whether it will enable Northern Ireland views to be taken into account as the UK implements its protocol and the, UK and the negotiations of the future UK-EU relationship is, to say the least, Mr Speaker, unclear. So, for some practical issues. We need to see the rapid creation of the Brexit subcommittee that was talked about in the, the deal recently last week. We need to parallel, we, in parallel, we need to establish a ministerial level lead cord to coordinate with the other regions. We need to have the representation at the JMC and to build a Northern Ireland case in London and Brussels and further afield. There is an opportunity here, First and Deputy First Ministers, to build a full partnership approach. A partnership on behalf of Northern Ireland between the political parties, the representatives of the business community, the third, the third sector, the civil service, relevant academic research, and we can all come together. Because, First and Deputy First Ministers, quite frankly, there is little appetite in the EU, in London, in Dublin to deliver for what is best for us here in Northern Ireland. The only way we can make these changes and the only way we can influence this if we all join together and to make this happen. First Minister and Deputy First Minister, you have a significant task ahead of you. We in the Ulster Unionist Party will be willing to support it, but we need to get on with it and we need to get on with it now. Thank you. Thank you. I now call John O'Dowd. Uh, it would be very tempting in this debate to reflect over the events of this last three years and where mistakes and errors have been made and where opportunities have been missed. And uh, while I may drift into that territory at some stages through no fault of my own, we have to learn from the past to make sure that we don't make similar mistakes going into the future. Because as the Taoiseach reminded, or the current Taoiseach reminded everyone last week, this is only half time. And the general public and the business community and the agriculture and all those people out there, for a variety of reasons, may have sighed a sigh of relief when uh, Boris Johnson's and the European Union's withdrawal bill was signed off on because they had hoped that Brexit would no longer feature on our news programmes and our political programmes and that progress had been made. The reality is that the hardest bit yet is to come in the relation to negotiating a trade deal. So, the responsibility of the Assembly in all these matters directly is somewhat limited because even though we have been assured that uh, we will have representations 
on various delegations and committees, etc. Uh, I and others sat on the Joint Ministerial Council in European format at a previous life. And I have to say they were the most frustrating meetings I ever attended because it was quite clear those sitting across the table from ourselves, the Welsh representatives and the Scottish representatives either didn't care or didn't know about the needs of the people we represented. And that's where we're going to continue to run into difficulties. So the more of a unified voice we can garner, the more focused voice in this chamber and the executive we can garner, the better. And I think what we have to remember is this. Brexit done great harm and great balance to the relationships that have been built up over this last 10 to 15 years uh, following the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, the establishment of the executive and the assembly and all those sorts of things. And what we have to do, and there's an opportunity through the most recent agreement, is to start rebuilding those relationships and realise that no one is going to defend our corner and the people we represent better than we can. Because no matter what your opinion is on the Union, no matter what your opinion is on the reunification of Ireland, the experience of this last three years shows us that we were going to have to stand up for ourselves or else we're going to be roughshod uh, into deals which do great harm to our economy, do great harm to future relationships across the island of Ireland. So there's a variety of reasons why members and political parties are voting against the withdrawal agreement here today. Um, and there, there is argument and rationale behind them all. But let's focus on the next stage around all these issues and try and get a, a common cause. The, I, I, I don't want to see a hard border down the Irish Sea, now or in the future, because it serves no benefit to the economy on the island of Ireland, the north, or whatever you may want to call it. It has no benefit, even where I want to see a future of a, of a united Ireland. I want to be trading with our nearest neighbours because that makes economic sense. Uh, we are socially, economically and culturally inextricably linked going into the future. And I don't want to break, or we don't want to break, any of those relationships. So we have to get a deal which ensures that there is trade between ourselves and Britain. We have to get a, trade, a deal which ensures that there is trade between ourselves and the European Union. And the reality on this island is this. Uh, when, you go along the border, when you go along the border corridor, the European Union is the next hedgerow. It's the next field, it's the next laneway, it's the next road, it's the next business. So that's the reality of what many who were uh, representing the, the British Cabinet, who were meeting us all, a, a number of years ago in the Joint Ministerial Council, didn't even recognise, didn't understand, and in my opinion, didn't care about. Because uh, Mr Gervin talked about... Uh, the, the politics of Brexit became a focus through a nationalist lens. But in my opinion, he was talking about the wrong nationalist lens because it was always about what English nationalism needed rather than what everybody else required to move forward. So uh, in terms of where we go next, the best way forward is for this assembly and this executive to work together to represent the people we represent to ensure that citizens' rights, workers' rights, trade, and all those things are protected and secured going into the future. Thank you. The call, Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support the motion. Um, I wish to, to emphasise that I do so as a Democrat, but we must nevertheless reflect that much of what was pledged by the Leave campaign has not turned out to be the way that the public were told it would be. There has been no easy trade deal, no extra money for public services and a weakened sterling contributing to rising costs of living. Despite all of this, I would argue that it is away from pure trade and pure finance that the biggest risks from Brexit are to be found. This is another reason why I would endorse Dr Farry's comments, um, recent comments in the House of Commons. The future arrangements must have the consent of the devolved legislatures who will bear so many of the consequences of them. I wish to remind the House, with particular regard to health, as this is my own brief, 
why, when it comes to arrangements with the future relationships between the UK and the EU, that we need to see detailed and realistic proposals for cooperation. With regard to health, sorry, with regard to workforce issues in health and social care in Northern Ireland, we are still without any reassurance that reciprocal arrangements will enable health workers from other EU countries to continue to work in Northern Ireland. Additionally, direct access to work, sorry, direct access to a labour market of over 500 million is of value not just to our health service, but also to the vital health research ongoing in Northern Ireland, not least in the Cancer Research Centre in my constituency. We also need agreement on mutual standards, not least to enable people in Northern Ireland to continue to seek treatment elsewhere, including through All Ireland partnerships such as congenital heart conditions or for rare conditions right across Europe. So we need to see detail from the UK Government on how it will ensure um, mutual access and mutual recognition so that people from elsewhere in the EU, EU can continue to provide vital care and research here. It is concerning, therefore, to see that one early step of the UK Government was with, to withdraw, in effect, from the Erasmus programmes. In fact, reciprocal programmes, research projects and even trade missions are vital to ensure that we have the most up-to-date healthcare knowledge that we can have with regard to treatment, medicine and even diagnostic equipment. We do not even have a guarantee on reciprocal arrangements concerning the E111 European Healthcare Insurance Card, meaning that people resident in the UK may have to pay for treatment elsewhere, something which would be grossly unfair to people with particular regards to rare conditions which cannot be met here in the UK. Many have a justified concern that they will, for example, be blocked off from international clinical trials. There is also a concern that a race to the bottom on standards will include standards on food safety and environmental regulation, which have a direct impact on population health. There is also the direct issue to local pharmaceutical firms that have access to EU markets. They will need to be unfettered, as we have seen that many have already started to set up bases in the Republic of Ireland, which results in a direct shift in labour and job opportunities across the border. Mutual agreement on medicine standards would be of interest both of our well-being and to our economy. Whether we are faced with the worst case scenario or even the best, we still need time to improve our data collection and dissemination, workforce contingency plans and communication requirements given the complexity of the issues that, which will arise on the January 1st next year in health alone. Even something as simple as the need for reciprocal rec recognition of driving licences, for example, for our ambulance drivers across the border, these need to be secured, right through to grave issues such as our ability to adequately access data and intelligence to combat sexual exploitation. Mr Speaker, this is just a brief outline of just some of the issues arising in just one area about which the European Withdrawal Bill is effectively silent and which we still have no serious guidance from the UK Government. This is true whether we voted Leave, Remain or not at all. For this reason, I urge unanimous support for the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call uh, Matthew O'Toole and I would remind the House that this is a member's maiden speech. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you for reminding everyone of that. Um, can I congratulate you, first of all, on your appointment? Um, you are an experienced chair. I am an extremely inexperienced member, so I hope to be calling on you for your um, advice in the months ahead. What do we know about Brexit? We know it's been deeply divisive in Northern Ireland and across these islands. That's why unity of purpose in this place today is so important and unity of message from this assembly. We also know that it is definitely happening. On January 31st, by automatic force of law, the UK, including Northern Ireland, will leave the EU. And that's why it's important that we send a message now about this withdrawal agreement bill uh, and what this assembly thinks of it, which is that this assembly does not give its consent. I'm in the unique, slightly strange position of actually having been a civil servant in the UK government when the Brexit vote happened and in the period afterwards. In many ways, the reason I'm here now is because of my own frustrations at the dilemma that Brexit has imposed on our island 
and particularly Northern Ireland, without its consent. It was clear long before the 2016 referendum that leaving the European Union would put Northern Ireland's unique situation at risk, both because of our land border with the EU, but also because of the complex web of identity and history that links this place, and this assembly is in many ways a manifestation of that complexity, to both the rest of Ireland and the rest of the UK. I also accept, even though I profoundly disagree with them, that many in this chamber believe in leaving the European Union. It's clear that this deal, this withdrawal bill, is rejected not only by those who rejected Brexit in the North, which, as we know and as speakers have reflected, is the majority, but also by those who supported Brexit, including um, others in this chamber. And I acknowledge, as others have done, that the, in a sense, rejection of this withdrawal bill is for slightly different reasons, and we shouldn't be shy about admitting that. But we have today the opportunity to do something important, to show unity of purpose in rejecting the withdrawal agreement bill. For the past three years, the government, the UK government, has said that the voice of all Northern Ireland's representatives, the voice of this Assembly, should be heard and that the Assembly should reconvene in order to enable that to happen. Well, we're here now. And if the Assembly rejects this bill, as we expect it to, then no minister in London can claim that there is any doubt over the view of Northern Ireland's representatives. And a few people have raised the comments that Sajid Javid made in the press over the weekend when he talked about the UK abandoning alignment. Well, I think it's worth saying that at every moment, at every time a UK government minister decides that the UK is going to diverge from EU rules, that's a decision they're making that will lead to further divergence in the Irish Sea. So I think it's really important to put that point on the record. People who are concerned about divergence in the Irish Sea should be considering decisions the Tory ministers in London are making about divergence, in, um, divergence from, from EU rules, and, and, and we should send that message as well today. But I also want to add, as someone who passionately supported efforts to avoid a hardening of the border in Ireland, and as I say, that's part of the reason why I'm here now, I see no contradiction in also saying to the British government, for which I not so long ago worked, that they have a responsibility to live up to their commitments in minimising disruption in goods as they move between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. That's what parties across this assembly have attempted to do at Westminster. And we've talked a little bit today about um, the amendments that were tabled at Westminster um, that had cross-party support with the um, support and advice of the business community in the last few weeks. There will be further votes on amendments like that in the days uh, ahead. And I, so I hope for that reason that we can send the clear message from this place that the parties here are also unified in supporting unfettered access for Northern Ireland businesses in Great Britain and in keeping the UK government to their um, pledges in terms of living up to that. At the minute we have assurances from UK ministers, but with respect to, to British ministers, people from all parties in this assembly have reason to question the value of guarantees from the Prime Minister and his ministers. In the years ahead, we will be debating exactly how the Ireland-Northern Ireland protocol works, exactly how it affects Northern Ireland and our island. Colleagues today have gone through in detail the vast range of areas in which life and policy will be affected in Northern Ireland. It is quite simply bewildering. That's why it's really important that today we send a clear message that this Assembly does not consent to the detail of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. It does not consent to the Brexit that is being offered. And I think um, the, the, the vital thing that we can do today is to send a very clear message to Westminster that Northern Ireland and its Assembly, when it comes to this Withdrawal Agreement Bill, says no. And I commend the motion. Can I call Roy Beggs? Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. I too rise to support this uh, motion. <clears throat> I do not consent to a border being drawn down the RIC with the uh, additional uh, bureaucracy that will flow with it, both in terms of regulations uh, and differences between uh, ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom, and I can highlight our biggest market, particularly for our uh, agri-food industry. Um, so we must ensure that difficulties that could arise from this uh, agreement are, are ironed out, avoid it. Nevertheless, we all have to accept that there has been a decision taken uh, by, the, by the British people, and there has been a decision taken by Parliament 
That is the reality, whether you voted for or against Brexit. But what we must do is to ensure that our economy, our people, our businesses uh, are not adversely affected by this uh, agreement, the withdrawal agreement. The agreement also uh, to, uh, has uh, agreed to set up uh, the Joint Committee, a new mechanism for uh, regulations governing Northern Ireland to be established, bypassing this assembly, bypassing uh, Westminster. It will be uh, made up of officials, appointees from Europe and the UK. That will be determining how we are governed. And that could have a very significant adverse effect if the practical outworkings of some of their decisions are not uh, foreseen. Uh, uh, so it's important that Northern Ireland and this Assembly uh, has uh, a very significant input into it. Yet there is no details, there's no talk about how that would happen. We cannot agree uh, to what has been uh, uh, deemed to be a withdrawal agreement so far. Uh, the, the, there are some very practical implications for our businesses and indeed uh, for my own constituency in terms of the Port of Larne. What infrastructure has to be built for additional inspection? Uh, is the car parks in Belfast and Larne, are they going to be big enough? Similarly, Warren Point. Are lorries going to be delayed? Are our agri-food industry, which is trans, uh, m moving very time-sensitive products to supermarkets throughout the United Kingdom, Will they be able to continue to meet their contracts? I previously uh, uh, had, uh, had a visit to uh, a significant distribution point in my uh, uh, constituency uh, and became aware of just how detailed uh, and how important time management is in terms of the agri food industry. If a container arrives at the distribution point late, it is rejected. And the manufacturer bears the cost, nothing to do, they haven't met their contract. So what will happen to our, our mushrooms with a very limited shelf life? Supermarkets want, uh, for, I'm just using for that for example, supermarkets want the maximum shelf life. And if we have any delays, that reduces the shelf life. They may not be able to maintain their contracts. At the very least, there's the potential of the value of our agri-food products being reduced because of having a, a lower shelf, shelf life. So we must ensure there are no undue delays as our goods move to our markets. Then there's the whole issue of the, the customs uh, border that will be created for goods potentially coming from Scotland to Northern Ireland. Will this put off some of our uh, goods that are coming that route? Alternatively, will um, supermarkets be forced to buy goods elsewhere in the EU? in the Republic, which may be more expensive, not, not what we're used to. They may be forced to buy more expensive goods. So it's vital that we get engaged and we do not sign up to anything without the detail and um, without being fully aware of the adverse implications that this withdrawal agreement could have on our, our businesses, our people and our overall economy. Uh, and it's for that reason I am happy to support this motion uh, and, and, and reject uh, the withdrawal agreement that has been proposed. There's a lot of work to do. We have to accept that this decision has been made, but we must try and mitigate and minimise disruption to our, to our people and our businesses going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And can I now welcome Sinead McLaughlin to make her main speech? Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is an honour to be called to make my maiden speech particularly on this very important issue. And before I speak in support of the motion, I hope that members can give me a small indulgence because I want to talk about my city and my constituency. But firstly, it is my privilege to carry on the mandate of my predecessor and party leader, Colm Eastwood. Colm is a superb politician, showing the value of properly representing the Foyle constituency in Westminster, for Derry and for all of Northern Ireland. I am proud of my party leader. The SDLP has new energy, but we stand on the shoulders of some of the greatest leaders in Ireland, John Hume and Seamus Mann. We have a strong history for civil rights 
as peacemakers, as Europeans. It is part of our DNA. I'm a dairy girl. I was born, reared and raised a family in my hometown. I love my people and my place in, in Derry. I am passionate about our city, and it is a city that is full of potential. Derry is a beautiful city where the wild Atlantic Way meets the Causeway Coast. We are surrounded by the hills of Donegal on three sides. We are a cross-city, cross-border region that is steeped in history and heritage and if walls could speak. I have lived in Derry in the very worst of times, and I have lived in Derry in the best of times, but I really believe that better times are ahead, and I want to commit to this Assembly that I will work very hard to make it the best of times better in the future. I support the motion here before us today. There is no good version of Brexit. Brexit is bad for our economy and it is bad for our citizens. I was the Vice Chair of the Remain campaign for Northern Ireland back in uh, 2016, while being Chief Executive of the London Dairy Chamber of Commerce. Economic forecasts, forecasts predicted that Brexit would damage Northern Ireland, especially in the border counties. Sure enough, last week, the Ulster Bank said Northern Ireland is now in recession. Thank you, Brexit. While Northern Ireland faced challenges of Brexit, we had a political vacuum and our business leaders stepped up. They tried to make sense and tried to make contingency plans with little or no information. Businesses are not orange or green. They just want to get on with things. I want this Assembly and our Executive to work closer with the business community, with all communities and with academics, and to move ahead with the Brexit implementation. But I am pragmatic. The UK leaves the EU on the 31st of January, 11 days from now. We need to play the ball where it has landed. The SDLP and the North did not want a land border in Ireland, nor did we want a watery border in the Irish Sea. All members of this House must work hard to ensure that the withdrawal agreement not only guarantees unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods moving to GB, but also for goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. There are competing narratives out there. The EU Commission will protect the single market and it will protect the customs union. It has said that the EU import and export formalities will need to take place. We need to understand what they are. I don't like this withdrawal agreement bill. It gives the UK government too much power over Northern Ireland and we need certainty around our future arrangements. Yet, we need to prepare for Brexit. Our economy is weak. We have poor productivity due to underinvestment in physical and human capital, especially in my city. We must build our skills to build our economy. Our second city needs a full-sized university of 10,000 students. We need to retain more of our talent instead of exporting it. Limiting the size of our university is a terrible act of economic self-harm. I will end by quoting the Irish economist John Fitzgerald, whose recent analysis of the North's economy said that to improve our economy, the most important steps are to reduce the number of early school leavers and to increase the number of graduates. That is true, Mr Speaker, and nowhere is it more important in the city of Derry, where the poverty levels are much too high? It is a failure that I am determined to challenge, and that is at the core of my new role in this Assembly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Cahill Boylan. I go to Margaret, I can call it Boylan, Lorch, the Vavar, our son in Ruin Shaw, and I speak, want to rise to speak in favour of the motion and 
just want to put on record my thanks to the likes of um, BCAB, which is the board of the group, um, against Brexit, who played a major role, a pivotal role, and brought the challenge to, to Europe on behalf of a number of people I represent being born and reared in, in a border county, and also the work of ECBAM, which is our central border area network, made up. It's a border uh, network corridor made up of a number of councillors who reported, who, who did three reports into border at the Brexit, and any person who has read any of those reports see the remarks and the challenges that are facing those people along the areas that uh, most of us, or a lot of us, sorry, represent. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is no good in Brexit for Ireland. Brexit, in any form, will be usually damaging for Ireland and the border region in particular. Our community, workers, farmers, small businesses and students will face considerable challenges in the time ahead, irrespective of the exact type of Brexit forced upon us. It is worth reminding the people that the people in the North voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. Sinn Féin have worked to secure unique arrangements for the North to offer some protection for the economy, to avoid any hardening of the border and to protect, most importantly, the Good Friday Agreement. These protections were secured not at Westminster but in Dublin and Brussels. Under the terms of the current withdrawal agreement, the people of the North stand to lose rights, funding and opportunities that derive from the membership of the European Union. A number of the social, workers and economic rights we enjoy are based on EU legislation. For example, cross-board access to some social security depends on European directives. My constituency of Newry and Armagh is a large, mostly rural constituency with over 70 border crossings and some others known to locals only. Brexit has the potential to devastate our constituency. The loss of access to EU funding streams is a grave concern. Newry and Armagh has benefited hugely from EU funding streams and we have absolutely no confidence in the British Government replacing them. Single farm payments via the Common Agricultural Policy were worth nearly £25 million to the New and Armagh economy in a single financial year. Membership of the European Union brings a number of opportunities, like the Erasmus programme, for example. While it's not flawless, it does present the opportunity for young people to study and work across the EU. This will be lost in the future. Mr. Speaker, a majority of our people voted against Brexit. We do not, we will not, and we do not consent to Brexit. That is the message we should send from this chamber today. Thank you. And I now call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just before I contribute to today's speech, I'd like to welcome my colleagues to the House and congratulate them on their maiden speeches in Ocean Aid. Matthew will be powerful advocates for their constituencies and the wider uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to contribute uh, to today's debate by supporting the Executive's motion and my party by not giving the British Government our consent over the withdrawal deal. I am glad that this executive has finally been able to show a united front in terms of Brexit, regardless of our political backgrounds. And equally, I am glad that parties here today have finally started to listen to business, to civic society and to the public who have long voiced uh, their concerns over Brexit and its impact here. In this regard, Mr Speaker, and having no representation in this very chamber for three very long and difficult years, I would first of all like to thank the EU27 for their solidarity in ensuring that the North and its people are protected insofar as possible from the worst impacts of Brexit. As a representative of West Tyrone, a border constituency, and as a Straban man who lives just a, few, uh, a short distance from uh, the border and Lifford, I know full well that there is no such thing as a good Brexit and there, that there are no positives to come from a British-imposed exit of the European Union. Brexit creates barriers to trade, it's silent on workers' rights and on social justice. It will inevitably damage Britain's economy and cause significant collateral damage to Ireland, both north and south. Despite the Prime Minister's promises, it will swallow up resources and funding, which means public services will take a hit. 
which has a long-term knock-on effect here as well, as well documented in the concerns of my fellow members. Businesses in my own constituency of West Tyrone are rightfully fearful as to what Brexit will bring to them in terms of tariffs, in terms of extra costs and in terms of bureaucracy. For three years they have felt voiceless and I am sure I speak for many in their uh, uh, joy of seeing this place restored to give them some voice to the challenges we face. This view is reflected right across the entirety of this island with grave uncertainty facing our agri-sector, manufacturing sector, our SMEs and many other industries, Mr. Speaker. The withdrawal bill does little to alleviate these concerns, while it is positive that the withdrawal deal does not place a de facto border across this island, it does create economic implications for trade with GB, which could hamper businesses and the economy here. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, the SDLP has serious concerns over the Northern Ireland Protocol and the lack of detail that it provides. That is why, Mr. Speaker, I was glad last week to see the North's MPs come together in the House of Commons, including my party leader, Colm Eastwood, and my colleague, Claire Hanna, to support amendments to ensure that the North has unfettered access to GB markets. This has major implications in terms of businesses trading between GB and Northern Ireland, in terms of providing declarations on animal health, VAT, tariffs, standards, rules of origin, and perhaps rules of destination. All of these are adding additional costs and resource requirements for business and huge concern, many of whom are already operating under fine margins. I have no faith that this Tory government will act honourably and offset this financial burden. The most recent behaviour of the Tory government would show that they do not serve our interests here. They never have served our interests here and certainly in the future will not prioritise our interests or the people of the north of Ireland. Mr Speaker, last week's amendments to protect business here were struck down with a huge Tory majority in Westminster and that leaves us in this very chamber with a very important role to play to shape the future of trade on this island. While the Government intends on cutting Northern Ireland parties out of the Brexit process and out of having anything to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol, it's important that we send them a strong message from this House. It's important that we strongly tell them that we do not endorse this deal, we will not be walked over and we will not let all of the rights and freedoms be taken away from us without a fight. And the restoration of this chamber and our politicians working together united in this capacity is vitally important. We need to utilise any leverage we may have to ensure that our protections are not removed against our will. We need a strong relationship with a new southern government to ensure that in terms of the EU we are treated fairly and equitably. Mr Speaker, the SDLP support the motion. Thank you. you. Can I call Rachel Woods? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, a maiden speech. Thank, thank you again. Um, it is refreshing to hear such objections to Brexit today. Given this, I would wonder who would have thought it was a good idea in the first place. It is of note that the First Minister stated correspondence was received last week on this matter. I would be interested to know, given the context of the previous and current item of business, when this correspondence was actually received. It would also be interesting to know when this letter was made available to members of this House, as members of the naughty corner here are yet to receive it. It is concerning at, that competences that have been devolved to this House and that are to come back from the EU are not to be devolved, but held currently by the UK Government. We must be sceptical of any assurances that there would, this would be temporary, as the scene changes so frequently. The needs of Northern Ireland do, not, do, do need understood and reflected in any agreement, but this is not what we have currently. What, what are the guarantees that the UK Government would be acting in the best interests of Northern Ireland on crucial decisions such as workers' rights, freedoms of movement, goods and services, as well as the future of our businesses, and actually taking these important concerns into account? But what of our common cause? What affects all of us? The future of our environment and the climate crisis? Why will we trust a government whose current record is summed up by an empty chair and a melting ice sculpture? Whose record is a prime example of greenwashing? For example, we're set to miss the 2020 and 2030 emissions targets on PM 2.5, for one important example. Mr Speaker, the majority of Northern Ireland never consented to Brexit. They voted against it. They continue to lobby against it. And they know it is an act of self-harm. This is the first time in many years that we have cross-party support reflecting the will of the majority of people in Northern Ireland. As such, we will be supporting this motion today, not to consent to the cutting of, the cutting of devolution settlement and the withdrawal agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Allister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In keeping with tradition, I congratulate the previous speaker on her maiden speech. Uh, I mightn't have agreed with very much of it, but nonetheless, uh, more of that, I'm sure, at other occasions. Uh, could I echo the point she made? Uh, the First Minister assured the House that all members of this House had been furnished with a copy of the Brexit Secretary's letter. I can assure her uh, I have not received a copy. I have checked with the business office. There are no copies in the business office. So I just wonder how uh, the distribution was perfected. Thank you, and, and thank you for allowing me to intervene, uh, Mr. Alistair. Uh, if I misled the House, I certainly didn't mean to do that, uh, Mr. Speaker. It has been led in the library for everyone, and everyone has access to it in the library. Now we know, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, if I could come to the substance of my remarks. The fact that the United Kingdom joined the EU as one nation, but is not leaving it as one nation, goes to the very heart and puts the finger on the betrayal of the withdrawal agreement as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. Because to all intents and purposes, Northern Ireland, under this deal, is to remain subject to the EU's customs union, subject to its customs code, subject to its tariffs, subject to the laws made surrounding that. We are also, to all intents and purposes, for goods, all goods, to remain within the EU single market, and therefore subject to hundreds of laws that we have no input into, that we will have no contribution to. We will be rule takers, both in customs and in goods regulation. And the practical, physical outworking, of course, is a border down the Irish Sea a manifestation of how far Northern Ireland's interests have been betrayed by this deal in circumstances in which the vast majority of our trade is with GB, the vast majority of our goods come from GB, a comparatively small minority of our trade is with the Irish Republic, and yet in order to protect unfettered trade with the Irish Republic, the answer apparently of this agreement is to fetter trade with GB. It is not very hard to work out the economic consequences of that for this part of the United Kingdom. It will orientate our economy away, and I do not care what the Prime Minister says. It is not the Prime Minister's rhetoric that matters. It is the cold, hard print of the agreement that matters. And what I have outlined is what it says. And therefore, the Prime Minister, for all his rhetoric, has consciously abandoned this part of the United Kingdom to the clutches of the EU, a sort of EU colony in the worst possible traditions. And of course, that is intended to orientate our economy away from the United Kingdom and to orient, orientate it towards the Irish Republic in the hope of some that economic unity is a relatively short step uh, from that to political unity. And I've heard some soothing comments today that there are those of a nationalist tradition who do not support a border with the Irish Sea. Really? Well, I just, I just remind them. It was their hysteria about prioritising no checks, no border, no recognition from Northern Ireland to the Republic that evolved and created this situation. And of course, it fits entirely into the glove of nationalism that you dilute uh, the link with Great Britain, that you establish a border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, and thereby you undermine that union. So I'm sorry. I don't buy the platitudes from some that this is not about undermining the constitutional 
and economic position of Northern Ireland. And that brings me to this point. We're told to take some comfort from the fact that now the executive is going to have an input into ongoing forward negotiations. Well, what's going to be the consequence of that? You have unionists in the DUP, and their party's position is, we want Brexit, we don't want a border in the REC, we want to maintain the integrity of the United Kingdom, economically and constitutionally, and you have Sinn Féin saying the very opposite. So what is going to be the input of this executive on those critical issues? It's patently going to be utterly ineffective, cancelled out one by the other. So I see no comfort in that regard whatsoever. And indeed, I suppose it takes me back in a way. Well, very well. I will not go there then. And so uh, with that, I draw my remarks to a conclusion. I certainly am opposed to this deal, but that's not because I'm opposed to Brexit. It's because I didn't get the Brexit that is a proper, thoroughgoing, successful Brexit for Northern Ireland. Member for his remarks. I now call on Jerry Carroll. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, People Before Profit is a socialist organisation. We want to see society organised in the interest of ordinary people, and for that reason, uh, we don't support Boris Johnson's Tory vision of Brexit, including the deal he is currently pushing through uh, Westminster. Unlike those who were happy to shake his hand and smile for their camera last week with him, we consider Johnson to be a dangerous charlatan who has little concern for people here and less concern for those who are working class and will be most impacted by the details of this deal. Mr Speaker, I have been clear in the past that I am no great friend of the EU as an institution because its foundations are built on neoliberalism, because of its role in forcing austerity in the south of Ireland and beyond, its treatment of migrants who had recently voted to allow to drown in the Mediterranean Sea, and most recently, Mr Speaker, because of its complicity in the stifling of democracy in Catalonia, including its complete silence it afforded when the Spanish state uh, cracked the heads of independence campaigners in Barcelona and beyond. But, Mr Speaker, we recognise that the vast majority of people here do not support Johnson's Tory Brexit, and we recognise that to impose it here would be a flagrant attack uh, to democracy, and we think that this deal could have a negative impact upon working-class people. I know too, Mr Speaker, that some parties here who blustered about Brexit for months, that when it came to negotiating a 60-page deal with the British Government just over a week ago, uh, the new decade, new approach deal, barely mentioned Brexit at all. And this tells me something, Mr Speaker, about some of the parties here. It tells me that their bluster about uh, Brexit was simply a disguised form of the usual orange and green sabre rattling that we get during every election period. And that when they were actually given a chance to do something about Brexit uh, by tying the British uh, government down to specific commitments, they failed to do so. People before profit, Mr. Speaker, believe that it's entirely possible to have a different kind of politics and a different kind of society, one that isn't tied to elites in London, Brussels, or indeed Dublin. And in our party, we stand with none of these elites, but instead stand on the side of ordinary people, no matter what their background. So today, we reaffirm our opposition to a Tory Brexit, to Boris Johnson's vision uh, for, our, uh, for our future, and we stand uh, for our own commitment to fighting for an alternative uh, socialist future. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you. I, I now call on Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Over three and a half years ago, I recall comments from an executive meeting that despite the outcome of the referendum, despite the differences in the room, that we would put our best foot forward and lead in the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland and Ireland. Sadly, we did not, and only those in the room heard those comments. The words of the First Minister this afternoon sound very similar to those spoken in 2016, and I sincerely hope that her words, along with the endorsement of the Deputy First Minister and the wider executive, are genuine because I have no doubt that each are acutely aware of the responsibility that rests on their shoulders and the scrutiny they face, not just from MLAs, 
but from those outside this building. We have two years, Mr Speaker, to convince the people of Northern Ireland of our value. And I fear, within a Brexit context, this will be incredibly difficult. The significant difference between now and 2016 is time and opportunity to do anything. While I appreciate the Executive Office creating an opportunity to enable members to share their concerns regarding the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, I agree with Mr Alistair's motion that we should have been able to exercise our scrutiny powers. It is disappointing that the majority of this House did not agree, and I will reiterate comments that I made on Restoration Day. It is regrettable that no party chose official opposition, but do not limit the integrity of this legislature further by removing our accountability. I will support the motion, and I do see value in this House coming together on an issue that will affect all of the people of Northern Ireland. I am, however, unsure of the practical purpose other than to send a very hollow message back to the UK government. It feels too little and far too late. We lost our opportunity to participate in the legislative consent process. We cannot formally reject the legislative consent motion. We are simply putting on record what I expect the UK government already know. And I expect the Prime Minister and his cabinet will treat our motion similar to how he has treated Scotland when they rejected it. I expect they will deem it non unnecessary, as they did the cross-party amendment on the 8th of January. Unnecessary for who, Mr Speaker? Certainly not the Tory party, who have no representation here other than the Secretary of State, who tells us to get on with it, even at the detriment of the most vulnerable within our society. I do wish to commend the DUP, SDLP and the Alliance Party for taking a practical approach in the House of Commons to address inevitable challenges that the withdrawal agreement will bring to Northern Ireland. They sought to provide much needed clarity regarding unfettered access for Northern Ireland to the UK mar market. And much cre credit to the Business Committee for their input. They have been trying to cajole politicians for three years knowing the potential impact Brexit will have on our economy. Stakeholder contribution is valuable regarding this and indeed every other issue we consider. Regrettably, the UK government rejected the amendment, arguing that government assurances over access to the UK mar market were sufficient. Since the momentous deal just over a week ago and promises of additional funding, I think that, that demonstrates to all of us that assurances from Mr Johnson's government cannot be taken for granted. Brexit is not over on the 1st of February 2020. It's the beginning of our biggest political test. Regardless of your view, in or out, undoubtedly dismantling 30 years of political, social and economic structures will be our biggest challenge. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. Uh, I now call the Deputy First Minister to wind on the debate, and the Minister has 10 minutes. Gary, and can I thank all members who have contributed to the debate, and I think it's been a fairly constructive debate in terms of our shared opposition to Brexit being foisted upon us. It's clear right, right across the House that there is widespread um, support that we should not agree to, to uh, give our consent uh, on this matter. And I, I note even just the, the recent comments from Ms Sugden in terms of um, it falling on deaf ears in terms of what the British government will do on the back of this. But nonetheless, it's really important and both the First Minister and myself felt that it was right and proper for this Assembly to have its say and on this matter. And that we also agreed that we should recommend that consent is not given. And I'm glad that, that that's the, the response the members have, or in, in the main, members have um, contributed to the debate today. There's no doubt that, and, and the First Minister said this in her opening remarks, it's for different reasons that we come at the position that we uh, come to today. Nonetheless, I think it's significant that we are in the space that we are today. It's of no surprise that this objection is shared by our colleagues in the Scottish Government, who other members have referred to today, and also the fact that Wales will vote um, tomorrow. So I don't think it's any surprise at all that this objection is felt right across Scotland, Wales and here. Brexit is unprecedented. Uh, no member state leaving the EU before now, and it's only 11 days until we exit the European Union after 47 years of membership. Since the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 and restoration of power sharing in 2007, the Union has provided significant financial support to the peace process under the peace and interreg programmes. We now have a restored executive and a fully functioning assembly, North-South Ministerial Council, British-Irish Council, 
which is what our citizens want and what we who are elected to this Assembly want, our shared determination is that these institutional arrangements will continue with, with much more vigour going forward. It is our responsibility as elected representatives to work together to ensure that the rights and entitlements of our citizens are protected and that we deal with the challenges posed by Brexit for the good of everyone. Members will recall that our Brexit priorities were set out in the letter that the then Deputy First Minister, the late Martin McGuinness, and the First Minister sent to the Prime Minister Theresa May in 2016, and I note that other members have referred to that. It was clear then, as it is now, that there could be no return to the borders of the past, and that any border could not be an impediment to the movement of goods, people and services. It is now absolutely imperative that we redouble our efforts to develop and rebuild a modern, competitive and sustainable economy and to safeguard jobs. We want to be equally clear now, as we were in 2016, that it is critical to our economy that our businesses are able to retain their competitiveness. Slowing businesses down or putting costs of doing business up is not in anyone's interest, including the consumers. Our membership of the EU has provided substantial financial aid towards infrastructure, agricultural subsidies and other grant aid. The First Minister and I will be working closely with the Finance Minister to ensure that the British Government are fully aware of the importance of replacing these funds so that many critical projects may continue to benefit our communities now and into the future. Energy is also a key priority for us, given our position in a small and isolated market. Businesses and investors will be concerned about energy costs and ensuring a consistent supply that meets the needs of modern industry. We need to ensure that this vital aspect of our economy is, under, is not undermined in the negotiating process. The importance of issues that affect our agri-food sector must also be considered by the British Government, as well as the important matter of replacement for cap funding. The British Government must also pay close attention to the agricultural community's concerns about the potential for additional burdens and costs. The industry needs early guidance and on any adjustments that it will need to make, and consumers too will look to the British Government to make adequate provision to provide any necessary assistance or mitigations. Brexit will also have significant implications for the work of our departments, and this will need to be looked at properly. Junior Ministers Kearney and Lyons will attend a Brexit meeting with the British Government tomorrow, Tuesday. The Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, MLA, will be with the Treasury on Thursday. Both I and the First Minister will attend the Joint Ministerial Committee on Brexit in Cardiff on the 28th of January. We will all be taking every opportunity that is available to us to strongly press the case for funding to help our key sectors of our economy. Many members have made very important points throughout the course of this debate and raised a number of very valid concerns, all of which we will be working hard to address. One of the most significant things, I think, over the course of the debate of the last three years has been the fact that the business community has spoken with one voice, has been the fact that the business community have made their voice heard loud and clear here in London, in Brussels. They have made sure that their, uh, that their voice was heard and was counted. And I want to com commend them for that work they have done throughout the course of that time. And that's everybody from the Chamber of Commerce, the CBA, Retail NI, the Retail Consortium, the Freight Transport Association. Now I'm going to get myself in trouble because I started naming people. <laughs> but the Manufacturing NI, uh, the Food and Drink Association, the Federation of Small Business, Hospitality NI, the Institute of Directors, the Ulster Farmers Union, the Construction Employers Federation and many, many other organisations were consistent and strong in, a, in articulating effectively the shared concerns for the future of industry here and we want to continue to work with them in the time ahead because there's no doubt that we face significant challenges to ensure that there are no barriers to trade, either north, south or east or west. We do not want to go back, as I said, to the borders of the past. And myself, in, the as in my role as Deputy First Minister and as Joint Head of Government, I am committed to working in the interests of everyone. We will be working with our business community and with the key sectors of the economy. Our businesses need to be able to benefit from any future free trade or agreements, if and when negotiated. We need to guarantee that we, along with the other devolved administrations, will be consulted on the wider trade policy, and I know that is the concern that members have articulated today. We are equally concerned about citizens' rights. And, what we, and we need to be engaging closely on developments around the establishment of the Independent Monitoring Authority for Citizens' Rights. The Executive Subcommittee, which we have agreed, which is written into the new decade, new approach, to consider Brexit issues is going to be a key structure in the coordination and development of our executive response. So we have much to do in this next phase, 
as preparations commence for the negotiations on the future relationship. The protocol affirms that the Good Friday Agreement should be protected in all of its parts. We will ensure that the British Government and the EU live up to those commitments and those responsibilities throughout the negotiations. To conclude, we must work together in common cause to overcome the challenges that have been imposed upon us by Brexit. Should the vote in this motion pass, then we will immediately respond along or to the British Secretary of State for exiting the European Union to convey to him that this Assembly has not given its consent to the, to the British Government to legislate on our behalf. I can first of all thank all members for the conduct of the debate this afternoon. It's been very respectful. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Moving on to item four on the order paper is the adjournment. The Business Committee has agreed that in order to enable committees to meet to address urgent business, the next sitting should take place on Monday, the 27th of January 2020. An order paper will issue after the Business Committee has met later. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you.